morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship this morning, whether you're here in the building or whether you're at home watching on the live stream. Lovely to have you here and lovely to be sharing worship with you. you please remember Junior Church, who are um, meeting in the cabin now. They're also dealing with, uh, with Palm Sunday. But before you go today, do have a look in the uh, east entrance where there is the Lego version of the Easter story, which the junior church people put together last week. So do have a look at that. Our Chinese friends will be worshipping here this afternoon, and so we hope and pray that they will have a good time also. Our services uh, for the coming week, as it's obviously uh, towards Easter, Thursday evening at 8 o'clock, it is the Tenebrae service. That's a lovely, quiet, reflective service when we will go through the whole story. Good Friday morning, here a fairly short service at 10 a.m. so that we can all go over to the town square for the act of witness which starts at 11 a.m. And then on Easter Day, the communion service starting at 10.30. And would you next week please uh, remember to, to bring a flower or two because we will take these things from the cross and then we will dress the cross with spring flowers. So please bring a flower or two so that you can help us with that next Sunday. During the week, we have coffee and chat on Wednesday morning. Graham Waugh is speaking. Pastoral visitors, please, there is a, a package of uh, things for you. The Easter delivery is ready. Please pick it up. It's in the East Entrance so that we can get out the things before, the, uh, before Easter Day. Do please stay for further refreshment after the service. Elaine will be bringing in our tea, coffee, and biscuits. In our prayers this week, please remember it, it is the funeral of David Woodhams on uh, Thursday. That's at 12 noon, so please have uh, David's family in your prayers. It's nice to see Jenny here this morning, who's having a rest from looking after David Broadley, who is at home recovering from surgery. Janet Atterbury has been unwell, but I don't think she's here. No. So think about Janet, please. And Edna Evans. And also, if you remember, uh, Ildi Johnson, who is continuing some very intensive treatment, and she needs our prayers and, and our thoughts. It's lovely to see uh, Anna back again. It seems, I don't know, it seems a long time since she's uh, led worship here, so it's great that she's here. And we very much look forward to worshiping, worshiping with her, and we pray that God will, God will bless. Our Lent liturgy this morning. It's uh, Palm Sunday, and we have some palm branches. So let us hear this, a verse from the Bible. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! This week's symbol is a palm branch to represent how the crowds greeted Jesus on his entry to Jerusalem, but how quickly they turned against him. Now, as we bring the palm branches forward, let's sing the two verses of Ride On, Ride On in Majesty.
forgive us when we choose the easy route, when we go along with the crowds and don't dare to raise our voices against injustice. Like those crowds on Palm Sunday, we are happy to join in with the Hosannas when things are going well. But it is more difficult to stand up for our beliefs when things are getting tough. Give us the courage to share our faith. Amen. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here back again with you this morning. A warm welcome to those of you in the church building, but also to those of you joining via the live stream. So let us join in a time of prayer this morning on this Palm Sunday. Let us pray. Today, we meet to remember that triumphal journey into Jerusalem. Churches all around the world will be gathering to do the same. The whole city was stirred and came together to bless God. We long for our cities, towns and villages to unite in a similar fashion. The whole city took part in the celebrations, improvising as they went, cutting palms and spreading cloaks. May we be open to share what our Lord needs from us to celebrate as a gathered community. Lord Jesus, you came to change the world. Forgive us when we become complacent, when change is difficult and we give up. Lord Jesus, you came to serve, not to be served. Forgive us when we put ourselves and our needs before those of our siblings. Lord Jesus, you came to bring peace. Forgive us when we cause more fights, more trouble and more wars than peace. Lord Jesus, you came to set the captives free. Forgive us when we don't stand up for justice and freedom for our neighbours. And Lord Jesus, you came to meet us where we are. Forgive us when we don't stand with each other through the pain and struggle. Help us to change the world by serving one another, working for peace, standing up for justice, and walking with our fellow pilgrims. Amen. And we join together in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our music group are going to lead our first two hymns, songs, whatever you want to call them this morning. So let's stand together as we sing. For the first song, um, Make Way, Make Way, the chorus is divided into the men singing and then the ladies singing. So it'd be good if we could do it like that. You probably remember this. Mehi way, mehi way, mehi way, mehi way, for the king, north kings, for the king, north kings. So the first make way is the men. So follow Graham. The second one that's in brackets is the ladies. So follow me. <laughs>
could have our reading this morning, please. The reading today is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Jesus' triumphal entries into Jerusalem. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door. Outside in the street, as they were, as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and then allowed them to take it. Then they were bought the colt then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many, many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that had cut in the field. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around everything, he, it, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thank you, Elishima. So today is Palm Sunday, where we remember Jesus entering Jerusalem for the Passover for the last time. We're told that the crowd cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road in front of Jesus. Interestingly, it's only in John's Gospel that we're told specifically that they were palm branches. In the other Gospels, we're simply told that they cut branches from the trees. And in ancient times, palm branches were considered symbols of victory, triumph and peace to the people of the Holy Land. And it's traditional to distribute palm crosses on Palm Sunday to commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So I'm going to pray over our palm crosses this morning, um, and then my helper is going to distribute them for us during our next hymn. And if any of the other children would like to help do that, that's fine as well. Gets my husband out of a job, I'm sure you don't mind. <laughs> So let us pray. God, our Saviour, whose Son, Jesus Christ, entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die, let these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing now our next hymn, which is All Glory, Lord and Honour.
you very much to my two helpers there. Great job. There are a few more if anybody didn't get one, if you want to. Oh, sorry, Graham. There's some more left for you. We'll make sure you get one. The 96th Academy Awards took place on the 10th of March this year. Did anybody stay up all night to watch the award ceremony? No. no. <laughs> I must admit, we, we recorded it so that we could fast forward the boring bits and, and get to the, the good bits. But we do always enjoy the Academy Awards. The real Oscar statuettes are made of solid bronze and plated in 24 karat gold. Well, this is the closest I think I'm ever going to get to one of those. Um, yeah, not quite bronze or 24 karat gold, bit of plastic from a toy shop. But for those in the industry, this is the most important night of the year, getting recognition from the Academy. And there's always so much speculation beforehand about who is tipped to win the awards. But there's just as much interest in the red carpet with people wanting to know which designers the celebrities are wearing. This year, people were shocked that Margot Robbie wasn't wearing Barbie pink and that Bradley Cooper had taken his mum as his date to the Oscars ceremony, which I think he'd done for a couple of years, which I thought was lovely. Hope you do that for me, Elishima, when you're older, if you go <laughs> to the Oscars. But human beings have always been drawn to celebrity, whether it's their looks, their words, their actions, or that je ne sais quoi, that something about them. Well, imagine then the crowds in Jerusalem at Passover, when the murmurs and the gossip spread that Jesus was entering the city. The man of the hour, the man that everyone had been talking about, this new celebrity. And the question on everyone's lips was, who is he? Today, we're looking at that first Palm Sunday and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem the crucial question being, who is he? And what is it that draws people to him? So let's set the scene in Jerusalem. The city was packed with thousands of pilgrims who had come to celebrate the Passover festival. The Passover festival commemorates the Israelites' liberation from slavery. In the book of Exodus, we're told that Israel was delivered from the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, because the blood of a lamb was placed above the doors of the home of every Israelite. And the angel of death passed over them, hence we get the term Passover. And during the festival, each family were required to bring a young lamb or wild goat to the temple as a sacrifice. And this was a time of families coming together to celebrate and commemorate that God had rescued and redeemed them. Palm Sunday is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. In Mark and in Luke, we're told that Jesus rode a colt into Jerusalem, which technically speaking could be a young male horse or a donkey. In John, we are told that it was a young donkey and in Matthew, a donkey and a colt. But the fact that it was a donkey seems to be significant, and Matthew's account refers to the prophecies from Hebrew scripture that Jesus fulfills through this action. Jesus' arrival on a donkey fulfills the prophecy from Zechariah. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We tend to associate the fact that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey as a sign of peace and humility, an alternate kingship, riding in on a donkey instead of a war horse. But it's worth remembering that donkeys and mules were also customary uh, royal beasts in Hebrew scripture. Solomon rode in to be anointed as king on a mule in the book One Kings. And during the Passover, Jews would have carried out a pilgrimage to the holy city by foot. But Jesus chose to arrive on a donkey, 
Not the kind of animal you would expect a king to arrive on. But then again, we know this is no ordinary king, and his choice of steed is significant. The crowd waved branches from the trees to make a celebratory procession for him, which also had royal implications. Stories were remembered of Judas Maccabeus, who 200 years ago before had arrived in Jerusalem after conquering the pagan armies that had oppressed Israel. He too was welcomed into the city by a crowd waving palm branches, and he was the start of a royal dynasty that lasted for over a hundred years. The people shouted as Elishma read for us, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And the word Hosanna literally means save or rescue us. Does anybody remember the classic game Guess Who? You can still buy it today. Yeah, brilliant. So you've got lots of different faces, lots of little cards, um, and you have to ask questions. Questions like, does your person have a beard? And then you put down all the, the faces that don't have a beard. Um, are you wearing a hat? Okay, if they're not wearing a hat, then you pop down all the ones that are wearing hats. Process of elimination so that you can find out the person. In terms of what the Jewish people were expecting from the anticipated Messiah, if they were playing a similar game, they might have asked questions like this. Do you have an army? No. Are you going to free us from Roman occupation? Will you wear an earthly crown? Because they were expecting a king, a political leader, who would free them from Roman occupation. But instead, this Messiah would display a different kind of kingship. Instead of taking the king's crown by force, he would instead wear a crown of thorns to show that God's love knows no limits to win salvation for humanity. The meaning of this triumphal entry for Jesus is quite different from the one they were expecting. And a week later, when the crowds realised this, their hosannas would soon be replaced with shouts of crucify him. Jesus was bringing about an upside down kingdom, a spiritual revolutionary, not coming to overthrow Rome, but to demonstrate non-violent love on the cross. Jumping forward to the, the book of Revelation, John says this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Has anyone seen any of the Shrek movies? A couple of people. <laughs> um, well, in Shrek 2, the, the sequel, there is a scene where Shrek, he's an ogre, a green ogre, and his um, sidekick, Donkey, they take a happily ever after potion. Um, Shrek wakes up the next morning, and he's handsome. He's a handsome man. He's not an ogre anymore. And when Donkey wakes up, he's become a beautiful white stallion. And he says proudly, I'm a stallion, baby. And I just really like that comparison between the donkey and the stallion. When Jesus returns, he will be riding a white horse and he will be glorious, our topsy-turvy king. Going back to the Oscars, the idea of the red carpet dates back about 2,500 years um, to ancient Greece where a path of dark red tapestries was rolled out in the play Agamemnon, when the king's wife prepares for the return of her triumphant husband from the Trojan War. And even the king hesitates to walk on this crimson path because he says, 
I'm a mortal, a man, not a god. It's interesting how the red carpet has become synonymous with movie stars who, in a sense, have become the royalty of today. You may be familiar with the story of Sir Walter Raleigh taking off his cloak and placing it on the ground so that Queen Elizabeth I could walk over a puddle without getting her feet muddy. Now, whether or not this story is true, it's a famous story because it's not the kind of thing that happens every day. It's a significant gesture, particularly if that's the only cloak that you have. It shows that you value that person highly. And this may well have been the case for the people in the crowd around Jesus. For many, they may not have had a second cloak, but they chose to spread it on the road anyway. It was a cultural way of showing honour. In two kings, the people spread out their cloaks on the ground when Jehu is anointed as king as a sign of loyalty. And it's clear that people could see something special in Jesus and that there was a real buzz in the crowd. How do you think you would have responded if you had been there that day? Would you have been swept up by all the excitement and followed the crowd? Or would you have stood back, looked on from a distance, wondering what all the fuss was about. What was it that they saw in him in that moment? A friend of mine explained that she believed in the historical man, Jesus, and that he was a good man, but she just couldn't believe that he was the Son of God. And for many people, Jesus is their stumbling block. Bono from the the band U2 was interviewed on Irish television about his faith and he said this about Jesus. He went around saying he was the son of God. Either he was the son of God or he was nuts, which I thought was quite an interesting way of putting it. Judah Smith, a pastor in Seattle, created a website a few years ago as a platform for people to express who Jesus is for them. And it received thousands of submissions from all over the world. People were invited to fill in the blank, Jesus is. And I've picked out just a few of those to share with you this morning that really struck me. Jesus is 100% man, 100% God. My identity Hard to find when I need him most. What people fight wars over. The one who saved my life. A prophet. What seemed to confuse me the most. Coming back. A zombie. Made up. A dead rabbi who meant well and is largely misunderstood. Stopping my dad from suicide. God's son. Life. Joy on a Monday. In the Bible course materials from the session on Monday night, the speaker in the the video simply put it this way, that Jesus equals salvation. Jesus is salvation. And I like the simple way that he put it there. Most people have an opinion about who Jesus is, whether they believe he was the Son of God or not. But who do we say he is? And how do we reflect this to others? How do the words that we speak and the way that we live out our lives reflect who Jesus is? Are we prepared to lay down the equivalent of our cloaks and wave our palm branches to welcome the true king into our lives, offering him our true selves. Praising God is easy when things are going well in our lives, 
but doing so when life is difficult can be much more challenging. So as we approach Holy Week, I encourage you to think about who Jesus is to you and what does he mean to you. Who do you say he is through your words and your actions? And the important part of that sentence is Jesus is, not Jesus was, because we know what happens at the end of that Easter story. I'd encourage you to just spend a bit of time this week in his presence, pondering the significance of that final journey into Jerusalem and the amazing love displayed on the cross before we rush too quickly to the resurrection on Easter Sunday and to reflect on the gift of grace that is offered to each and every one of us, no matter who we are or how far we may have strayed. As we draw closer to Jesus, may we too reflect the love of Christ to all those that we meet through our words and our actions. We're just going to have a little moment of silence and then we're going to pray together. Lord Jesus, you gave up all the glory and splendour of heaven to live in our messy world with us. You rode into Jerusalem, not on a war horse, but as a humble servant king riding on a donkey, subverting people's expectations of the Messiah. You gave your life that we may have life to the full. As we enter Holy Week, we want to draw closer to you. We want to see you at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We want our whole lives to declare that Jesus is, not Jesus was. You said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. We want to live resurrection lives, giving you all the glory, honour and praise. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our next hymn now, which is number 277, My Song is Love Unknown.
building, you have an opportunity to come and share something of your story, um, of where God has been at work in your life this week. Um, So if there is anybody that would like to share, please feel free to, to come forward to the lectern. Yeah? A week past Friday, I've got a van, you probably even know I've got a van. A crutch went on me a week past Friday, but, um, Princess Estate, Bermuda Drive. I found the AI, like you do. I sat there, it says an hour and a half before they come to you. Eventually I turned up a bit early. He says, right mate, follow me. Then I stole the van, right? He says, I need you, I need you to find the tall truck, the truck to take you to the garage in the hostel. I sat in the van for five hours before I turned up. Now, down East Hill, maybe there's trees, there's birds flying about. So I'm sitting there in the van, looking at the sky, looking at the trees, looking at the birds. I never got stressed, I never got upset. I just sat there, be calm and cool and collective. And the guy turned up, a lovely guy, he put my van in his truck, he told me to hustle. The guys in the garage, uh, Ian and Roy, were still there. So we're leaving at five o'clock. So just we put the keys in the little box. They're still there. Put my van, they gave me the keys, and I left. So this what happened to me last week on Friday. Thank you, Ian. Anybody else? Anything that you'd like to share? Jean? Um, last week at Foundry Worship, we talked about belonging and who we belong to and who belongs to us. And that stayed with me quite a lot through the week. In fact, it's what I based my leadership notes on this week. But it also brought something home to me. I've got a sister-in-law in a nursing home, and my sister and I find it very, very difficult to visit her. She's not an easy person. She's got all sorts of problems going on. But it occurred to me this week that she's lost her sense of belonging. She's lost her house. Yes, she's still got her family and she's still got us, but she's finding it so hard to fit in and belong where she is. So it's that subject of belonging, thank you, Hugh, has made me more aware of what is actually going on in people's lives. Thank you, Jean. John was mentioning earlier about the the users of this building. I think we might have a slide, is that right? Perhaps we could show that, just to talk through all the tenants that will be using the building this week. Um, Something important, I think, to to remember, um, and to remember those groups in our prayers, that this is a really busy place, a real thriving, bustling place during the week, so much going on, and it's important that we we pray for those groups and for the, the funeral also that's taking place this week. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so let's move on to our prayers of intercession. We'll bring all those prayers together. Let us pray. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when peace will be the foundation and aim of all nations. We look to the leaders of nations factions, armies and dictatorships where peace is not present and we call them to respond to the suffering and heartache around them by negotiating and bringing peace. Among other places we remember Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, North Korea, Haiti and Sudan. God of all, You made everything and everyone. We pray that people will respond to your desire for all to live lives of peace and that hope would defeat harm. We pray for all those whose families, lives and futures have been destroyed by war and conflict. As we look forward to God's kingdom, 
We hope for a time when love and care are the foundation for all that we do. We give thanks for those in caring professions and those who look after others. God of all, you call all people who are willing to hear. We pray for our health professionals, education staff, parents and carers. We pray that they would be encouraged and strengthened in these times of tight budgets and lack of resources. And we remember children and young people who may be facing worries and challenges. And we ask for your help for all who are struggling because of physical or mental health. We particularly remember in our prayers the family of David Woodham and the funeral due to take place this Thursday. For David Broadley, recovering at home, and Jenny, his wife, looking after him. And we remember in our prayers Janet Atterbury, Edna Evans, Ildi Johnson. And in a time of silence, we lift to you all those known to us who are struggling in mind, body or spirit at this time. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when all will be full of the enjoyment of life and will grow in faith in you. And we look to those who lead us in churches, in our country and in our neighbourhoods, that they would work to keep people safe and happy and that they would have the wisdom to spend limited money wisely. God of all, you give us all we need. We pray for our government and parliament as they use scarce resources, plan budgets, and work out how to spend money for the benefit of the nation. We pray for local elections and the campaigning that has just started. We remember our church leaders in this area and ask that you would work together across denominations to bring the life and growth that can be found in Jesus to our friends and neighbours. As we look forward to God's kingdom and remembering that amazing journey into Jerusalem, we look to ourselves. May each one of us, young and old, Know the love of God through the gift of Jesus, the power of God through Jesus' death, and the joy of God through his resurrected life. God of each one of us, you know all we are and all we need. May we hear your call on our lives and do all we can to share your love and your kingdom with others. Amen. We're going to sing our final song this morning. Um, waving your palm crosses as you sing isn't mandatory, but um, it's encouraged. Uh, we're going to sing our final song. Give me joy in my heart. Keep me praising. Sing Hosanna. <laughs>
morning. As the crowds gather to welcome and celebrate the coming kingdom of freedom, peace and justice, so we lay ourselves before our donkey-riding King, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let his vision be our vision, his kingdom be our kingdom, his call be our call, his journey be our journey, and his life, death and resurrection be our salvation. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.